Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so we all have this vision of a decentralized, trustless intermediary that's kind of a, a construct and that allows you to do transactions, um, both financially, trades, and also computational tra transactions, right, to execute code. Um, but we have seen that most of them don't scale, and a lot of talks here also today are about scaling. And at the same time, we don't want to move back to a centralized custodian system, right? A custodian that holds your funds. You want to remain in a system where um, you, you, you're basically interacting with a non-custodial intermediary. And um, what I would like to explore today in this talk is the concept of a centralized but untrusted intermediary. And I think this uh, concept um, has not received sufficient attention in the past. So sometimes it might be actually OK to work with a centralized intermediary, which is non-custodial, um, because it's not trusted. So it doesn't hold your funds. It basically really just facilitates the intermediary uh, job that you, that you require. So in particular, today we're going to talk about so-called payment hubs. So uh, uh, thanks very much for the previous uh, presentation. It's about layer two. It's about scaling on top of another blockchain. So it's really a, a layer up. Um, more specifically, the, the architecture I would like to talk today about is liquidity's uh, no cost. So this is here a particular payment hub, and you have uh, four different users that are members of this particular payment hub. Some might be on mobile, some might be on a PC. And the idea is that these users, they can do an off-chain registration. So they can actually join this particular payment hub without having any crypto. Okay, that's, that's key. Um, and another member of this payment hub that might already have some crypto, uh, some off-chain crypto, can send some off-chain crypto to this new member. Um, and this new member can then forward it to another member. So, and if there are no transaction fees uh, asked, if there are no transaction fees on these, on these payments, then this would foster significantly financial inclusions all over the world, right? You can literally send, like, for example, on the Ethereum blockchain, you can send one way, and one way is 10 to the power of minus 18 Ether. So it's like, you can really enable microtransactions. Um, so Liquidity Network sees itself as a plug and play scalability solution. So on the underlying blockchain that it's building up on, you have typically just about 10 transactions per second if it's a proof of work blockchain, a proof of work permissionless open blockchain. And uh, the transaction costs range anywhere from like five cents to 50 US dollars, and it's pretty unpredictable. And this unpredictability doesn't allow you to build any sustainable business on it, right? Because you do not have any service level agreement with anyone. So liquidity is a layer on top, and it can, can scale to more than 10,000 transactions per second. Um, it allows zero fee transactions. It's already operational on the Ethereum mainnet uh, since June. Um, you can do instant tra transactions and swaps. So atomic off-chain swaps of assets are currently on the testnet. Um, and you can do service level agreements. So you can get a guaranteed transaction throughput, a guaranteed 100 transactions per second, for example, or guaranteed uptime um, uh, and, and particular services. And these services, they can be offered to, for example, wallet providers, so wallets that want to basically perform cheaper transactions for their users, decentralized exchanges, very interesting use case we will talk about in a bit, apps that are powered, centralized exchanges, as well as liquidity provider. Um, so this is just to set the, the scene, but how does this actually work? What's, what's, what's behind? Um, so I will give you a brief demo of, of how this would work in practice. So if you have, for example, a liquidity wallet, what you can do, you can create a, a new wallet by, by hitting this particular button, and this creates um, a typical Ethereum private, public-private key pair. You choose your authentication method, and then you have a wallet which is ready. So this is very typical for any wallet, any on-chain wallet that you know nowadays, no? So what's the difference here? So the difference here is that you're already connected to an off-chain payment hub. So you are actually off-chain. So it means that once you install this particular application, you have a connection, you have a payment channel to an end-party payment hub. Okay? You have no crypto. Um, so you can see here at the top, there are two elements. So you have a so-called what we call liquid ether. You can call it also off-chain ether. It's the off-chain pendant to ether, and you have typical on-chain ether, right? So 
one liquid ether is equal to one ether. This is enforced by the underlying smart contract. Um, and the idea is that uh, you can you can any time convert between those two. Right? The fundamental difference is if you transfer to another party the liquid ether, it doesn't cost you any transaction fees because there are no gas costs involved. And I will go into the details of the gas costs in a bit. So let's make a simple demo here of the um, of the fossé that we have. So if you press this particular button, you basically get some free ether. And in, in our case, currently, it's about 100, e 100 way. That's literally not much, right? So um, it, it won't bring you far, but it, it just demonstrates the purpose that you can actually transfer uh, minuscule amounts of, of funds uh, in practice. Right. Um, OK, so how does this work? Um, what's the architecture behind, and what are the security assumptions? This is what we're going to cover now in the more technical part uh, of the presentation. So we, as I mentioned, we built upon the blockchain, right? So this is a proof of work, open blockchain, typically. It could be actually any type of blockchain. But let's, let's assume for now it's a, it's a proof of work blockchain. So this blockchain is smart contract enabled. It has, for example, uh, an EVM. Uh, so on Ethereum, we can uh, construct a no-cost smart contract. We need a, an off-chain counterparty. And this off-chain counterparty is a server. Uh, this is one particular server uh, who facilitates the intermediation between participants. In particular here, the particip participants are Bob and Alice. So let's assume for the time being that um, Bob has about one ether on the, on the blockchain. So this is on-chain, right? If he wants to use this off the chain, he deposits this one ether in the smart contract. So similar to the payment channels that you saw in the, in the earlier presentation. Um, so once this is deposited, then Bob can use this particular ether and sign a so-called IOU and send this to the NOCAS server. So NOCAS server, he signs this particular IOU, and then he forwards it to Alice. Alice say, thanks. I'm, I'm, thank you for delivering this, uh, this particular payment. Um, and after some time, so after a particular checkpoint interval, the NOCAS server submits a checkpoint to the underlying blockchain. I will go into detail what this checkpoint is about, what it contains, etc. What's key is, is that the NOCA smart contract he validates and applies the IAUs to the user account balances. Okay, and this is done on-chain. So it's kind of an on-chain settlement that is periodic. In NOCA, or in the, in the mainnet Ethereum version, this is currently every 36 hours. It's just um, similar to a block time interval. So it's really a parameter that you can play around with. Great. Uh, so now we are there, and um, Alice can also enforce the IEUs that she that she received because they are signed by both Bob and the server. She can always enforce them on the chain, if need be, in the case of uh, misbehavior, as we will see in some later slides. So what's the key innovation? I mean, you might have heard of some of these commitment schemes, right, that periodically commit to the chain. This might not be very new. So what is actually new here, and why why does it make a difference? Um, so the fundamental novelty in NoCust is the bimodal ledger structure. So what you can see here is a ledger structure of six accounts. The width of each account represents the amount of stake they have off-chain. Okay? So for example, in this particular example, we have from 0 to 36, we have different six different accounts. Um, and they have different sizes. And the size corresponds to the stake they own off-chain in the NOCAS smart contract. So how is this now checkpointed on the chain? I guess some of you uh, might already guess. So yes, we do a Merkle tree. So, but it's not just any ordinary Merkle tree. It's actually an augmented Merkle tree with some additional information. Uh, Merkle tree by Ralph Merkle is basically you take the leaves, you hash them together, pairwise together, and you hash them up until you get, you get to, the, to the Merkle root. The Merkle root here represents the checkpoint data. Okay, and this is what is checkpointed every 36 hours to the underlying blockchain. And because this amount of data is really small, the, the checkpoint data not only is constant in size, but it's also small by definition, and this makes it particularly cheap. 
Um, so what are what are uh, what's very important in the, in the in the blockchain space is to always look at at the security assumptions and what can happen if an adversary does something bad, right? Uh, in particular, if you're if you're building non-custodial systems, so systems where um, you trust someone to not hold your funds. In this case, you not only want to verify that he is actually a non-custodian, so you need to, for example, read his specifications, you need to read the smart contract, uh, but you also need to understand the protocol and make sure it's actually non-custodial. And I'm sure many regulators will have nightmares um, verifying those things in, in the coming years. Um, before I go into the very specific security discussions, I would like to make some, some definitions, uh, just to, so that we speak the same language, in a sense. Um, so in particular, I would like to discuss the collateral requirement uh, for a hub for instant finality of transactions, of off-chain transactions. So I would define instant finality as something like, similar to it's very unlikely that my funds are lost, right? So it's really, it's kind of, um, after six Bitcoin block confirmation, it's very unlikely that my funds are lost, right? So it's kind of we reached finality after six Bitcoin block confirmations. And in no cost, if you want to have this kind of finality, uh, the hub operator needs to set up some collateral. Uh, this, the collateral corresponds to the sum of the funds received by all the users within two rounds. A round is defined as uh, basically between two checkpoints, this is a round, right? Um, so on the current mainnet on Ethereum, this would correspond to the total transaction volume that the hub server sends to their users within 72 hours. Okay? So what's very important, contrary to payment channels that you have seen also in the previous talk, the collateral is not like a, the total transaction volume, right? It's time-based, uh, which makes it interesting because it, it reduces the total collateral requirement that we, that we actually have. Still, it's true for 72 hours, this can become quite big, right? So there might be some optimizations to lower the, this, this checkpoint interval time. But uh, let's, let's go on with security first. So let's assume for now the NoCast server disappears, and he disappears uh, right after he submitted the checkpoint, so there are no further transactions that have been performed, okay? We still have here this architecture, the blockchain, smart contract, and server. And let's assume this is the time access, or like the blockchain, and there's the first checkpoint, let's call it the Genesis checkpoint, right? So this is kind of the first checkpoint um, within this NoCast instance. Then let's assume there are like a few users, and they perform off-chain transactions. And these off-chain transactions, they transmit off-chain funds between themselves. And after 36 hours, there's a checkpoint that's coming, right? The checkpoint takes this augmented Merkle tree, it just takes the bimodal ledger structure of the balances, hashes it up, uses the checkpoint, beam on the chain, okay? Um, and let's assume this happens another time. And let's assume that at this very point in time, after the, the, this checkpoint was committed, then the adversary just goes offline. He doesn't do any malicious action. He just goes offline, is no longer, no longer responsive, and there are no more transactions uh, performed. Let's assume this for, for time being. So what happens is that the transactions from one to 200, they're all committed on the chain, right? They're all represented within this uh, bimodal ledger structure. And um, that's, that's a good thing. They can be withdrawn by the clients, and there's actually no deadline. So this means, even if the hub server goes down, there's no deadline. You can retrieve your funds like next week, next year, the smart contract will keep them, right? Good, let's go to the second uh, case, uh, security case. So let's say the NOCA server disappears after a few transactions have happened, which are not yet committed in a checkpoint, okay? So like before, we have the time access, we have a checkpoint, 100 transactions, another checkpoint, with another 100 transactions, and then let's, let's assume there are 30 transactions here. And these 30 transactions are kind of, you can call them almost unconfirmed, right? They're maybe floating in a memory pool if you would be talking about Bitcoin. Um, so they have not been yet committed into a checkpoint, not a block, right? right. Checkpoint. Um, so, and then the adversary goes bust. So what happens then? Well, uh, transactions 1 to 200 are safe, right? We discussed them before, that's, that's cleared. Um, now, what about these 30 transactions um, that we want to discuss, uh, the, uh, the transactions until 230? So they're not committed on the chain. 
So what happens to them? Well, the Noka smart contract has some collateral to back those transactions up, right? And this is maximum the transaction volume of 72 hours, which would correspond to two rounds. And uh, with this, the, the users can retrieve their funds of those transactions that happened there. Okay? Good. Let's talk now about a setting where, I mean, this was just a kind of denial of service. Now let's talk about the security of double spending, off-chain double spending. How would that work, right? Um, so let's assume we have the following setting. We have Bob, we have Alice, and we have some other Bob that's colluding with Bob. Um, and we do have the Nocast server. And let's assume for, for now that um, the, the Bob has 50 Ether off-chain. And you can see this here, visually I represented it as, a, as the balance structure, right? There's this 50 ether that is represented within this balance structure. Um, and let's assume for the time being, Bob tries to make one transaction to Alice, and this is 50 ETH. It needs to be signed by the server, right? Every transaction that goes to off-chain has to sign by both Bob, so the sender and the server. And now Bob will try to do the same transaction uh, to, and send it to Bob Prime but the server is not misbehaving in this particular example, so he will not sign this double spend transaction, and as such, this doesn't work. So now let's assume a stronger adversary, an adversary where not only a, a user is malicious, but also the server is malicious, okay? I believe this is something that some of you probably are interested in now, because this is one of the strongest adversary scenarios that you, that you can think about, so not only the Users are malicious, but they're also colluding with the hub server. So what could happen is that, yeah, uh, the Nocast server signs off on, on two transactions, right? So this is, this is actually possible here, and it could po be possible that Alice is then victim of a double spent attack. So what, what however will happen in that case is that either the, the hub attempts to create coins because the balance ledger structure would need to represent 100 Ether, right? So if, if the hub server attempts to create coins by creating a bigger, a bigger balance, uh, um, uh, bimodal ledger structure, then it will checkpoint this to the smart contract, and the smart contract will see this checkpoint plus the total amount of Ether that should be in this checkpoint, and will say, hey, there's something wrong here. This doesn't work. So the smart contract will basically hold the server uh, and challenge it at this very point in time. Okay? And then Alice would be able to retrieve her funds again with the collateral that has been set up for the 72 hours. So that's one case. The other case is that the adversary tries to steal coins. So from, who, from whom could he steal coins? Well, he, he could steal it from Alice. So in the balance, uh, in the bimodal ledger structure, you can basically override the balance of uh, Alice with, with this of Bob Prime, right? Um, but as soon as Alice would observe the checkpoint on chain and would see, oh, I don't have my, my balance anymore, well, then, then Alice will challenge the hub and the hub will go down, uh, lose its collateral uh, as discussed before, okay? Good, so what are the operational costs? So this was for the security analysis, let's go for the, for the operational costs. Uh, a checkpoint uh, is roughly 2.23 US dollar uh, every 36 hours, so every, every round. So this makes an operational cost for the, just for the blockchain part, which is less than 50 US dollars. So it's pretty cheap for a financial intermediary that can actually process uh, thousands of transactions, right? The client storage, um, because we have, a, we have an account-based model, right, for the client. Um, so this is actually only a few, a few of the last checkpoints that are required uh, for minimal security from the client's perspective, which is also good, right? Any mobile client can, can store this kind of data. What about the client availability? So contrary to traditional payment channels, a client in no cost needs to be online only once every 36 hours. Why? Well, he needs to check the checkpoint, right, which was submitted on chain, and verify that his balance is still fine within the, within the bimodal ledger structure. He still wants to see, I still own my 50 ether in my, in my particular off-chain balance. And, but it's enough to do this every 36 hours. Uh, so that, that's already a relaxation, I would say, compared to payment channels where you need to be online constantly. 
Um, and uh, so currently, in order to receive a payment, you need to be online, and we do have a, a protocol improvement scheduled for this year that will actually enable the recipient to, to also be offline uh, in order to receive a payment, which would make it equivalent to a traditional blockchain transaction um, and make, uh, make many applications more usable. So what about the, the gas costs now for a withdrawal? A withdrawal is the process of moving the off-chain funds on-chain. Okay, so it's basically coming back on the chain. Um, you can see this here in the, in the blue line. And here I'm assuming a non-collaborative withdrawal. Non-collaborative means I'm actually not working with the hub server together to do this. Because if I would be working with the hub server together, the costs are actually constant. Um, so I briefly explain withdrawal. So on the x-axis, you can see the number of users. Please note, this is a log scale. Okay, so we are here 10 to the power of uh, 10 to the power of five um, users, so 100,000 users. And on the y-axis, you have one's gas costs and one's gas costs in, in US dollars. Um, a state challenge here is is uh, basically a, a challenge to the hub. Uh, if you want to prove that the hub did something wrong, this is how much you would need to pay to initiate a state challenge, and then the hub would answer a state challenge. So these are just the costs of, of operation. So what you notice here, because we have a log scale and the, the, um, the, 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 the graphs here are, kind of look linear, it means actually that if we extrapolate this data, and by the way, these measurements, they are done on our, on our production system. So this is not theoretical, this is actually deployed measurements. Um, if we extrapolate this and we look at, once we reach one billion users, how much does the withdrawal cost? Still costs less than one US dollar. Okay, so that's, that's key. It's, it's really scalable, no cost is really scalable to billions of users because of the, the cheap withdrawal costs in, in case of misbehavior. So even once we have a billion users, the server goes away, the server dies or runs away, you can still take your funds out of the smart contract. You can still do withdrawal for less than $1. Um, I think this is, this is very important, uh, very, a very important uh, characteristic of non-custodial systems to, to be scalable and cheap even in case of misbehavior. So what are the limitations? I mean, sure, I, I want to tell you how great NoCust is, but there are also issues, right? Um, so the, one of the major issues that we see nowadays is non-collaborative withdrawals take up to 72 hours. So these are two rounds. So it's, it might be quite some time. You might say, well, there's no deadline on a withdrawal, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, but still, I think it, these type of withdrawals from a smart contract should be faster, and there are some ways on doing them faster. There's still quite some collateral requirement for instant finality. Um, this can be played with if you change the, the, the time interval, right, of the checkpoints. Uh, regarding privacy, uh, yeah, the hub sees all transactions, right? There you don't have privacy towards the hub at the moment. Uh, you have much better privacy towards everyone else in the world if com compared to like a traditional on-chain Ethereum transaction, but still there are at least three parties involved, sender, hub, receiver. Um, and currently in NoCast and Liquidity Network, we have a single hub instance, so it's a single centralized server, which is untrusted, but we envision a network of different hubs operated by different people and that are very well connected and that can transact and trade among themselves. Right? Um, and regarding trade, uh, so I discussed a lot about payments, but I think what's very exciting is the off-chain swap. So instead of sending a transaction, we actually do send two transactions that are um, of different values, of different tokens, um, and those are performed atomically, which means that either they're both performed or none of them is performed. Um, and I believe this would allow to build so-called DEX 3.0. Let me explain. So a DEX 1.0 is something called like similar to Ether Delta, right? It's where you have an on-chain order book and an on-chain settlement. So a DEX is typically comprised of two of those two elements. Um, uh, you can also have sometimes a reserve system, but um, let's let's stick with order book for now. So these are slow um, because well you need to confirm the transactions on chain um, and you need to pay gas fees even if you do an order and even if you cancel it, you're gonna pay gas fees even if it's not executed, right? So they, they pay gas fees, uh, but these are actually properly decentralized, right? Which is cool. 
Um, the Dex 2.0 um, is kind of partially off-chain. So what is typically off-chain in, in those Dex 2.0 instances is the order book, okay? So the order book is, is uh, some kind of server, and uh, the final settlement system is conducted on the chain, okay? So we're still limited by the, by the, by the underlying blockchain regarding the settlement. And the third class of DEXs that are gonna come up soon are decentralized DEXs that have an off-chain order book and an off-chain settlement system. So what's striking about this is that they can actually scale towards the transaction volume and speeds of centralized exchanges. Right? Um, we do have a testnet version of this ready on the Ethereum RinkB testnet um, and playing around with it um, since like uh, two weeks. Um, and hoping to, to move this forward to the mainnet. But we actually welcome also other DEXs to build on liquidity and use our settlement system, right? We really see our, ourselves as a platform for other DEXs to enable them to have off-chain settlement. Okay, so in order to do so, we have released now an SDK. So basically you can just use your current DEX wallet app, use our SDK, and then build your more scalable uh, DEX wallet or app that you have. Uh, having said that, yeah, thank you very much for your attention and thank you so much.